Hey everyone, welcome back for another episode of AI news, drama, and updates. We're in the very final week of March here, and as always, there's a ton to cover in the AI space. In fact, it was such a big week, I did a breaking news video just a few days ago, so be sure to check that out if you haven't already. But as far as this week's headlines go, and finishing up for the final week of March here, let's go ahead and dive right in. First thing on the agenda I'm going to talk about is Mr. Drew Carey. For those of you who don't know, and I didn't know, Drew Carey is apparently doing a radio show. He made use out of an AI technology by a company called Eleven Labs that allowed him to duplicate his voice and basically use AI during different parts of the radio broadcast. And uh, the fans weren't happy about it. I haven't had a chance to hear any examples of it to know how obvious it was. It's potentially possible they just outright told everyone this is what we're about to do, and obviously people who already had a disposition towards AI were going to feel some kind of way about it. But in terms of what he got out of it, what he got from the feedback and things like that, uh, Drew Carey has apparently learned not to do it again. Uh, Engadget talks about a story that we didn't actually get a chance to cover here on the channel, but this same software has made headlines before because people of the internet have used it to impersonate everyone. Uh, Emma Watson, Joe Rogan, you know, a ton of different people. And so, yeah, I, I would say this is a, another stark reminder of the power slash responsibility of those who wield AI. It's a very powerful tool and it can be misused very easily. Moving into BARD. So last week I mentioned that I did not have access to the BARD waitlist. Well, I've got good news for you guys. I got access to BARD. Uh, the bad news in that is that BARD is nothing to sneeze at. It's kind of terrible. Now, I've talked before about GPT and how it feels magical to use, how when you type something in, you're going to get something that feels unexpected. BARD didn't give me that feeling. BARD made it feel like it was simply placating me. It was answering the question, but I could tell that it was just fabricating. It was just making stuff up. You know, I asked BARD, for example, about my YouTube channel. And it said, yeah, I found it. And I asked it if it could subscribe. And it said, sure, I just did. And of course it didn't, but it said that it did. It was just lying. To me, Bard seems capable of holding up a brief conversation, but not really capable of doing what GPT does. And so with that in mind, it's very refreshing to see that they're already planning on switching this to a much more capable model. And I think that's a smart step in the right direction. And we'll check back in after next week and see what the improvements look like. This is actually something I just came across on Twitter, but I wanted to show a demonstration of a large multimodal model that can be done from a smaller GPU type system. From my understanding, OpenFlamingo is built off of Llama, which is the meta large language model that was meant to run on a smaller GPU. Now, of course, large language models are just about language, associating text to other text and words to concepts, things like that. Whereas multimodals can do things such as images, video, any other type of input. Now we've seen stuff like this with stable diffusion when we're using image generators, text to image, image to image, things like that. For a long while, we've been able to submit a picture, hit the interrogate button and get kind of a visual descriptor back. And so to make sense out of what you're seeing and why this is so powerful is this combines that aspect with something like a large language model so it can do something with that information. So what we should be able to do is just drop pictures in here and have the system kind of understand what it is. And as you can tell, it's dead on. That is a futuristic tank. That is a tank of the future. That's what they do. They fly in the space. Of course, when you give it ridiculous input like I've done here, you're going to get ridiculous output. It's not going to be able to make sense out of things that it doesn't have any connections to. But being able to do things like count the amount of objects in a scene or being able to supply the answers to questions based on the context of an image, it opens up a lot of doors for the future. Now, I wanted to switch gears a little bit to NVIDIA and the future of NVIDIA. We talked about them last week. We talked about how their CEO wants to live forever as a robot. I'm not sure if that's a joke or not. Kind of a weird guy. The news this week is NVIDIA is making public statements that are very anti-crypto, specifically mentioning that crypto doesn't actually help the world, but AI has a potential to do so. While I would imagine crypto farming was huge business for companies like NVIDIA, it also came with a very negative connotation. For anyone that doesn't know, the reason that NVIDIA would have been involved in something like crypto to begin with is actually really similar to why they're involved in AI. Both processes make an alternative use case for the type of hardware that NVIDIA provides. The special RAM and the special processors that go onto video cards, they just do things slightly faster and more differently than the processors that are elsewhere in your computer. So because the fate of cryptocurrency is pretty much tied to these GPUs at this point, this is a pretty bold statement to make, and I'm sure a lot of people who are really deeply invested in crypto aren't really going to be super happy about that. And segueing from not super happy people 
I'm going to touch base real quick on this open letter. This is the video I talked about a few days ago. This is the people that are trying to stop AI development. And while I will say this is getting slightly larger media coverage, the list of signatures hasn't grown substantially just yet. The only update that I had here that I did want to elaborate on was that I did notice they also had filed an FTC complaint. So we may hear more from that. And of course, as I hear something, I'll update you guys here. Moving over to Microsoft, I'll say Microsoft has made an announcement that a lot of people are probably looking forward to where AI is going to be involved in the next version of Windows. I think for a lot of us that have been following along, seeing Microsoft putting AI into everything, this is not going to be any kind of surprise. Microsoft seems to be completely all in when it comes to AI and AGI, and I haven't seen any examples yet where I've seen them shy away from investing whatever they can into everything they possibly can. It's kind of crazy. In just a few months, Bing has gone from being the most laughable search engine on the planet to being probably one of the more powerful generative search tools that exist. And of course, I really want people to start competing like crazy against them because I want to make sure that these additions, these features aren't overly annoying and shoehorned in in a way that Microsoft tends to do with most of the products. Like how many times have I had to delete Edge from my desktop, for example? But the idea that the search functionality within Windows will have some kind of machine learning component to it, that seems pretty amazing to me. And we talked before about the inclusion of AI in the Office applications and things like that. And I'm not opposed to that at all. I think it's going to be an amazing addition, especially for stuff like Excel. But the initiative they talk about in this article, it looks like it's referred to as Core PC. So as you hear more and more about potentially Core PC, that's going to be an AI-focused version of Windows or something along those lines. We're going to keep an eye on that. And something else I've been constantly keeping an eye on is Runway. Runway ML continues to work on a text-to-video type of model. As we see more and more examples of text to real video, where it's looking more realistic and less stylized, Runway is really starting to kind of bring things together. So text-to-video is still a very fledgling software. Examples of that still look very basic. I don't know if you saw the Will Smith eating spaghetti. Uh, check that out in the corner of the screen here. But Runway has continued to work on their text-to-video model and video editing. Anyway, it's inspiring to see how far they've come and how much this video is starting to look not silly, and more and more like video, less stylized. So kudos to them on that. I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with it. The last thing I want to talk about in terms of future tech was something that I came across here on Reddit, uh, taskmatrix.ai. Now, Microsoft has talked about AGI for a bit. And to give you an example, uh, again, of multimodal models and what they can do, uh, this is a PDF document that talks about task matrix, which is supposedly a super AI. And that's Microsoft's words, not mine. I'm going to make sure to link the PDF in the description so you can check out the whole thing. But looking at the summary here, one of the things that stuck out to me right away is how it can perform both physical and digital tasks. And that, I would imagine, is making use out of the multimodal stuff that we were just talking about. You can imagine a system that can interpret physical input. That's going to be one of the first steps to kind of seeing and understanding the world around it. In terms of AGI, to be able to see is going to be pretty important, I would imagine. So if you can imagine a super system that has a API platform where programmers can connect to it, add to it at will, it has a lifelong ability to continue to learn on things and adapt to new circumstances and better interpretation for how it just can respond and understand to different input. That's kind of the goals and the aspirations here from what I understand. So we're going to keep an eye on this because that's very, very impressive, but this is also very new. All right, so looking at this conversation, you got a human who says they can't draw. They draw a terrible picture of an apple. They ask Task Matrix, hey, can you turn my terrible picture of an apple into a real apple? And then Task Matrix does that. You know, all this here is more of an example of just what a multimodal model can do. You know, here's an example of a command where you can tell it to wake you up at a certain time, and it's going to save that and respond later. It's going to do a series of tasks at a different time, which when you compare it to what a model typically does, you usually give it input and you get output right away. There's usually not a delay, usually not a schedule for different things. So this is already starting to look very different. And as you can imagine, over time, we're going to see more and more complexity. So this is why this is exciting to me. Midjourney has officially cut off free trials. And that is thanks to a lot of crazy people from the internet trying to make deep fake photos of all kinds of different stuff. The images of the Pope that came out that a lot of people saw in the puffy jacket, I'm not sure why people took offense to that. He looks kind of awesome. Uh, the Donald Trump getting arrested photos, though, I, I understand 
uh, that could be, you know, politically concerning for some folks. But the real issue here is that Midjourney, Midjourney V5, is now almost indistinguishable from real photography. So because a lot of these free accounts were being made to test this out and kind of push the limits of what these very realistic looking photographs could get people to think and assume, uh, Midjourney, I think rightfully, cut off the access to the free trial. Now, this doesn't mean that people can't use Midjourney anymore or people won't be able to use the paid services. It's just that we're going to see less deep fakes than what we would see otherwise. And in terms of weird and wild images in general, Bing's AI chatbot, as we're talking about GPT-4, the Bing bot, I would imagine you're going to start to see this in a very limited capacity because this isn't something that everyone's going to be able to do right away on day one. But you should be able to run to Bing and ask it to generate an image. I'm not sure exactly how many you're going to get out of it. But if we go back in time and remember that Microsoft purchased DAL E, this is one of the things that they've kind of chosen to do with it. And one of the last things that I wanted to cover in the world of AI art is text to text. If you look at the Objiverse as a dictionary of basic things that models can use, access, and understand, it makes a little bit more sense. This new technology can assume what a texture should look like based on what it knows from that data and based on the input that you give it. Now, when we're talking about the Objiverse, and I'm not sure exactly how expandable that universe is, we are talking about hundreds of thousands of objects. So there is a lot of capability here. But I know for 3D artists, especially for 3D textures, this has probably been one of the more common requests that I've had in my Discord, in comments and channels. And so seeing we're a step closer to being able to just generate 3D textures on the fly, that's a huge step in the right direction for independent game developers or people who are spending a lot of time texturing 3D models for various projects. To end today's video, I want to talk about GPT-4 and a couple of quick hitters. The first big one is that Microsoft has found a way to monetize their GPT-4. They're now going to be slipping ads into the generative output. So if you ask for something, you may get an ad as a suggestion. In the examples that I've seen, it is very clearly marked as an ad within the generative output. My concern is for the future, though, where that line might get a little bit more blurry. If ChatGPT, for example, just started recommending things and those things were influenced by capital interests, that would be corruption. And that's a big problem. As we've talked about models and we've talked about biases, as far as I know, we haven't encountered a model that acts with greediness or selfishness in mind with the type of information that it gives you. But a lot of these models are in the hands of people that are either they themselves greedy or work for a company that has to continue to make more and more money. And they might be inclined to do very greedy things. So I do feel like this is something to keep an eye on, something to be wary of. But obviously this was expected with anything. They're going to be dumping a ton of money into this. They had to find a way to get money out of it. And the last thing that I wanted to cover, and this kind of just came out right before the video, is that Italy has decided to just block ChatGPT. It would seem that Italy has an issue with the data protection. It's saying that there's not enough being done to protect children, just, you know, all kinds of different claims. And as far as I can tell, they haven't officially blocked anything yet. It's just a call to action. So we'll kind of see what happens there. Man, today's video was kind of a wild ride. I appreciate those of you who stuck with me till the end. If you did me the honor of a like or dislike even or a comment or any kind of interaction, that's all great for the YouTube algorithm. But I really, really appreciate your time here with me. And as always, thanks for watching.